what rattles me, uh, I get really irate with injustice and unfairness. The healthcare industry is full of inequities, and so there, there's a lot of fairness to, to fight for there. That's absolutely right. That may be why I was so passionate about, even though I love doing surgery, actually leaving the practice that I love so much in order to try to fix healthcare. Hawaii healthcare leader, Dr. Ginny Pressler, next on Long Story Short. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in high definition. Aloha, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Dr. Virginia Pressler is Executive Vice President and Chief Strategic Officer at Hawaii Pacific Health. At this time, it's Hawaii's largest nonprofit healthcare network with four major hospitals and more than 50 outpatient clinics throughout the islands. Dr. Pressler, a one-time banker turned surgeon, turned health industry executive, goes by Ginny. She's a leader in the effort to transform healthcare in Hawaii. Throughout her career, she's pushed for initiatives that encourage healthful habits and improve the well-being of Hawaii's people. Ginny Pressler's story goes back to the small plantation town of Hana on Maui. There, a famous artist would inspire her mother at age 12 to change the course of her life. My grandfather was the manager of the Hana plantation, so she lived in Hana. She grew up on the plantation there, and there was no place to stay in Hana, but lots of artists and other special people would come and stay at the plantation, and my mother was exposed to all these wonderful people. Now, Georgia O'Keeffe came uh, to Hawaii when my mother was about 12. She remembered my uh, my mom and my grandfather and grandmother talking about George O'Keefe coming. My mom was a voracious reader. She was homeschooled, read all the time, and so she knew all about George O'Keefe, and she was all excited about Georgia coming to to visit. And then my her mother, my grandmother, got called away to uh, the California where her mother was ill, and so my mother at age 12 ended up being the hostess with my grandfather to George O'Keefe when she came to stay in Hana. And so my mother showed her around for about 10 days and the George O'Keefe in Hawaii, which is a book uh, that's out that has a picture, uh, one of George's um, paintings on the front, it was written uh, by my mother. Was she showing her the um, landscape to for, for for pictures and did she hang out while there was painting taking place? She drove her around and took her to places. Drove her? Yeah. At age 12? Maybe Georgia drove and she was showing her where to go, I'm not sure. I guess that probably was how it worked. <laughs> Although you never know. Yeah. In I the mean, country, I know that all things happen. She got her license when she was 14, but uh, I don't know if before that that she drove or not. Uh, but she, she showed her around, took her to the places to see her favorite flowers and things like that. And, and George O'Keefe developed a, a real love of the, the floral uh, beauty of Hawaii. Does your mom tell any stories about uh, a particular place or comment? Well, you know, I think what really impressed my mother, what George O'Keefe sort of changed my mom's life. I mean, she was living in a very isolated, really, in Hana, uh, homeschooled, as I said, and doing a lot of reading. And when she met Georgia, it sort of opened up her eyes to a whole new world. And it was after Georgia left that she told my uh, grandfather, she said, you know, I, I know I'm going to go to Punahou in a few years, but I want to go now. And so she went, like, in eighth grade, I think, to board at Punahou, uh, which was quite a, <laughs> a move for her from rural uh, Hana to Punahou. And she met her husband while a teenager at Punahou. Yeah, when she was uh, 15 and uh, was at a uh, family mutual friend's uh, place up uh, Alexa Zabriskie in, uh, in Kula would uh, uh, entertain the uh, servicemen uh, that were stationed uh, on Maui and that's where she, she met my father. And my father was out here in World War II as a fighter pilot on an aircraft carrier and he was from St. Louis so after the war my mom uh, and dad got married in St. Louis. So many local girls married servicemen at that time, yeah, didn't they? That's right. In fact, when my dad met my mother, he was uh, eight years older than she was, and uh, he had told my grandfather that when she grows up, I'm going to marry her. Ginny Pressler and her four siblings were born in St. Louis. Like her mother, Ginny Pressler's life would change at age 12 when her father moved the family back to Maui. She says it was a welcome escape from the frills of St. Louis's teenage debutante balls to a laid-back lifestyle. And you lived where on Maui? We lived in Spreckelsville in an um, old um, 
plantation house that was, we were just renting it. Um, so the nearest it, public school was Kaunoa? Kaunoa School, right. So I walked to school with my neighbors uh, barefoot to Kaunoa and uh, uh, after school we'd uh, just hang out under the monkey pod trees or we'd go and play beach volleyball or you know go to the beach or just hang out together. You know, you and I are of that generation where there was no such thing as play dates or right. structured play. Right. What, what was childhood like as, as far as, how did you spend your free time? I was more the adventuresome type. I liked to go out and explore and find things. So I liked to um, go out in the woods and the streams or the ocean or the beach and just explore and and find things, build forts. Uh, build forts. Just, you know, climb <laughs> yep. trees. Uh, we used to do lots of fun things on Maui, a lot of fluming, um, hiking. Um, fluming is something kids don't get to do nowadays. It's yeah. too dangerous, or the flumes have broken down those water-carrying structures. They were such fun. And of course now you could never do that because we were on all the plantation uh, property, mm -hmm. but um, we, at that time you could get away with it. And did you ever complain, I don't have anything to do? No, <laughs> no. We just, I mean, that was, if, uh, if I ever complained to my parents I had nothing to do, they'd find something for me to do, right. I'm sure. So I mean, you it wouldn't necessarily definitely be. occupy yourself. Right, right, right. We were expected to be self-reliant, and uh, I was one of five children, so we all kind of took care of each other, and I remember doing a lot of babysitting and fixing dinner for my younger brothers. And what were your parents like in raising you? Achievement apparently was important by, Very. by virtue of the schools, I can tell. What were they like? Well, I remember my dad always saying, I don't care what you do as long as you do it well. And so that was the mantra, was you always do your best. And there's no excuse for not doing the best you ever can. Uh, at the same time, uh, my dad was very loving and um, f full of fun and adventure. We did a lot of fun things together, and he loved family, but hardworking, very hardworking. What about your mom? And my mom was a stay-home mom. She was very involved with others in the community, did volunteer work, did a lot of needlework. And so when we moved back to uh, Maui, she was volunteering. Uh, and then when, we, when I went off to college, my family moved to the uh, Big Island and uh, she opened up uh, Waimea Woolcraft where she was teaching people in the community how to do uh, needlepoint and, and knitting. And then that expanded into the Waimea General Store, which she still has today, and my brother takes care of that. Is that right? So that's a hub. Uh, so many people have shopped there for many years. What prepared her, you think, to, to run the store? Uh, she must have liked people. She loves people. I think my whole family are entrepreneurs. I'm the only one who's working for a company. Everyone else, all, all of my siblings, my father, my grandparents on both sides were all entrepreneurs. So you lived in St. Louis until you're about 12, uh, and then the rest of your childhood was spent on Maui. D has that neighbor island background informed the way you live your life today? Very much so, I think. And, and it's been very helpful to have, uh, I consider having grown up, uh, that's my memories really are, are the, the time on Maui as, as a child. And it, it really has shaped uh, my attitudes towards healthcare in the state, uh, as well as just the needs on the neighbor islands and recognizing how different it is in the rural areas. Uh, that's a very important thing in all the, all the areas I've been in, especially in the last uh, uh, 10 or 15 years where I've been on either public health or uh, administrative side of health care that we're trying to provide throughout the state, recognizing the, d the different needs on the neighbor islands, and, and they're very different from Honolulu. That's true. You can't say neighbor island is a general uh, thing when you're talking about health care or growing up because every island is so different in different. its culture. Yeah. On Maui, Dr. Ginny Pressler attended H.P. Baldwin Public High School, then transferred to Seabury Hall, a private school in Makawao that her father helped establish. In fact, she was in Seabury Hall's first graduating class of 14 students back then. Her family then moved to Waimea on Hawaii Island, while Ginny Pressler left Hawaii altogether to attend Cornell University. Well, I started as a math major, and then I got into social psychology, and uh, I really enjoyed learning about how people form attitudes and their behavior and how, how difficult it is to change behavior, which 
to this day, I look back at things I learned so many years ago, and it's so true still, although the science has changed quite a bit about attitudes and behavior change. But People group, haven't changed. <laughs> yeah, and the group dynamics and, and how, how group decisions are made. And you know, So it was fascinating for me to learn how people think and work together, and I use a lot of that uh, today in the work I do. And in healthcare, you are trying to change how people behave, so you, you do draw upon that. That is one of the most difficult things when people know that something's not good for them, but to get them to change behaviors is very, very difficult. So before you got into healthcare, let's back up and you're, you're graduating in social psychology, and what was the plan? At the time I was going to go on to graduate school uh, in educational psychology, and I came back, couldn't wait to get back to Hawaii. But I uh, decided I sort of had, wasn't quite sure what I was going to do with it. If I got a PhD, what would I do with that? And uh, decided that I should probably just get a job. So I started uh, working at Bank of Hawaii as a management trainee. I was very fortunate to get into a management training program and uh, learned a lot. I mean, it was a totally foreign uh, field to me, banking. I was there for five years and did the whole gamut of banking, but it never quite uh, fulfilled my sense of, is this what I remember? one day saying, so what are, where do I want to be 30 years from now? Do I, if I'm going to stay at the bank, obviously I'd want to be the president of the bank. Is that what I want to be? And I said, no. So then the question was, well, then why am I there? So that's when I started doing some soul searching about what I really wanted to do with my career. And the medicine just kind of came up. How did it come up? A, a friend, a relative uh, who was in med school at the time, just for some reason I was visiting and went to see his med school and all, and uh, he mentioned, he said, you know, I think you'd make a really good doctor. And maybe he knew I was sort of soul searching, trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I don't know why he said that. But it just sort of, a light bulb went off in my head and I went, yeah. It was a combination of the math and science that I loved. I always wanted to be a scientist when I was a kid. And I wanted to do something meaningful to help people, and I like to work with people. And uh, it just all came together, and I realized that, yeah, that's what I should do. I was 27 at the time, and uh, the things I, were, I was reading said, if you're over age 26, you're too old to go to med school. <laughs> but uh, that didn't stop me. Dr. Ginny Pressler went back to school and enrolled in pre-med classes at the University of Hawaii's John A. Byrne School of Medicine. She also gained hands-on surgical experience at a cardiovascular research lab. She was still a pre-med student when she decided she would become a surgeon. You're talking about cutting, cut, cut, cut in, in sensitive places. Um, what prepared you to do that? I can sort of compartmentalize and not get uh, emotionally distracted. When you're operating on uh, somebody or, or, or you're even an animal, uh, it's, it's, you're focused on what you're trying to get done. You were, you were in there for the duration. You were a surgeon. In fact, you started specializing in breast surgery, which at the time wasn't um, usual. That's right. In fact, I remember interviews with you 20 years ago uh, about when I was a breast surgeon. That's when your hair was longer and mine was shorter. Well, that's right. <laughs> about that's 20 right. years ago. That's right. Did you have a scary moment in surgery? Probably, I think the scariest uh, cases were uh, trauma cases where there was massive liver damage because the bleeding from that is very difficult to find the source. So I had some scary times when uh, uh, I was in the operating room. Uh, but I've heard so many people say it takes so much to get you rattled. I mean, what does rattle you? <laughs> You're very composed. Well, I've, I've, um, I guess I've always been composed. Uh, what rattles me? Uh, I get really irate with injustice and unfairness. What do you what, do? What used to get me really upset when I was a kid was my younger brother and I used to fight, and uh, he would, you know, he would, you know, punch me or instigate me, and then I'd, you know, fight him back, and I'd get him down on the ground, and he'd say, "Let me go," and I, I won't hit you, and I'd let him up, and then he'd hit me, and I would get furious. You know, it's like that's not fair. You know, he said you weren't going to hit me back, so uh, I think the fairness is. Uh, when things aren't fair, when I see people doing unjust things or unkind things to others, um, that gets me upset. Well, the healthcare industry is full of inequities, and so yes. there's a lot of fairness to, to fight for there. That may be why I was so passionate about, even though I love doing surgery, actually leaving the practice that I love so much in order to try to fix health care because it was wrong. It needed fixing. That is a huge bite. I mean, you knew that wasn't going to be okay, here's my three-year plan. Mm -hmm. I mean, you knew that it might be a lifelong 
adventure or 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 less than that? What was your thinking? I've always been an adventurer and a risk taker, uh, calculated risk taking, and uh, I was following my heart, my my gut, that healthcare was broken and I could only do so much in private practice, even if I brought in a partner and I tried to create this, this comprehensive care for patients that I couldn't do it on my own, that I needed a bigger system to do it and that we needed, in fact, to fix the whole system of healthcare. And you, you worked in government. How, how far did you get in, yeah. in, uh, in that endeavor? Well, I was, had actually been running a health plan uh, for a while and then uh, w worked at the Department of Health uh, from 1999 till 2002 and was deputy director at the State Department of Health. And it was just about the time of the master settlement agreement with the tobacco industry, so there was money coming in for the tobacco settlement. So I was very fortunate that I was given the leeway to work with those funds and, and convince the legislature and the administration that most of that money should go into health care. So that's when we created the Healthy Hawaii Initiative that was focused on physical activity, nutrition, and tobacco control. And obesity then, this was, you know, what, 15 years or so ago, was a major, was beginning to be recognized as a major problem. And uh, here we are 15 years later, and it's a bigger problem, but it's finally being recognized as a real issue. And that's one of the eternal frustrations, it seems, of healthcare. Every, every, we, we make advances, and uh, but sometimes you just don't see the, the results you want. Well, I'll read things and recognize trends and say, yeah, that's clear. It's very clear that this is what's happening and this is what we need to do. But the rest of the world isn't there with me. <laughs> I'm, I'm always looking out longer term. Thanks in part to Dr. Ginny Pressler's long-term vision, Hawaii Pacific Health is recognized as a national healthcare leader. Back in 2002, the organization was an early adopter of electronic medical records, an important piece in streamlining patient care. Throughout her career, Ginny has gone by the name Pressler. That's her first husband's name. She's been married for almost 30 years to Andy Fisher, but kept the name Pressler for practical reasons. Well, I got married the first time in college, and we were married for about uh, 10 years, and you know, then we got divorced. Uh, and because I got married in college, I had my, all of my diplomas were Pressler. So from undergraduate, and then my master's degrees and my doctorate degree were all uh, uh, in pre under the name of Pressler. And I was known professionally as Pressler, and I was 37 or so when I met my current husband. And so I already had that professional name and chose not to change it. So when we got married, um, I actually am legally Fisher, but I kept the name uh, professionally. Uh, the funniest part about it is that my husband is such a great sport because we'll go places where he gets called Mr. Pressler. It's bad enough it were my maiden name, but it's not even my maiden name. It was my first husband's name, and my husband handles it very well. And your children are Fisher. They're Fisher, right. Your um, little girl, your youngest child, is adopted. Yes. How did that come about? Well, we, we had lost a, a child, and um, we wanted to have two children. We, when, when we lost our son, we felt that things were unbalanced having just one child, and we had always wanted to have two kids. So we tried to have another child, but I was in my mid-40s by then, and um, after trying some in vitro and other uh, attempts to, to have another child, we finally realized we love every kid we see everywhere. It's like it doesn't have to be our genetics. Uh, and so we decided to adopt. And um, I'm so glad that we did. It was a, a, a wonderful experience. Mothers always say there's no difference in how you feel about a, a adopted or a blood kid. Um, but were there a difference in um, her perspective or the way you raised her? Yeah. When we had uh, Katie, our youngest, I didn't feel any different. I, I always felt the same about her as my own. And in fact, since we had lost one child, and then, and then, and I was there for Katie's delivery, I actually cut the umbilical cord. It, we, it was an open adoption when I, we'd been chosen ahead of time to be the parents. So I was able to, to be there for the delivery, which was wonderful. So I've always thought of Katie as, you know, I, I forget that she isn't my own natural born, although she's a different ethnic makeup than we are, but it's never really connected to me. It's like, she's mine just like, and there's no difference in how I feel about her. And so it was very interesting for me to find 
find out as she was growing up how hard it was for her. She never liked the fact that she was adopted. So you did an open adoption. Does that mean there was any continuing um, communication with the, the birth mother? Yes, we had an open adoption and uh, we did have a uh, connection with the birth mother, but she uh, stopped uh, uh, contact after a couple of years. So Katie never had a chance to ask her, could you tell me about the circumstances right. of my right. adoption? Right. Although sometimes information doesn't answer a question of the heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she seems to be settled with it now. But you know, you never know. I, I, I hear about an awful lot of uh, adopted children who even in their 40s or 50s still want to go back and connect with their birth mother or father. Yes, I have an adopted child as well. And, I, and I, I, she did get to meet her birth parents when she was about 21 and um, that's why I do think that even when there's love and a chance to get together and get to know, there, there's still questions that sort of are unknowable or answers mm -hmm. that are unknowable. Yeah, and I've, I've come to understand that as much as I can now, which I didn't appreciate before and that's another thing that I've learned. I mean, you just take things for granted that, well, we love her, what's the problem here, you know? But from her perspective, I can, can see that there's there's a loss. Personal loss is familiar for Dr. Ginny Pressler. In addition to the death of her 14-month-old son, she also lost her father at age 58 to a sudden heart attack on the tennis court. She calls her father the kingpin of the family and a big piece of her life. He and I had gone out to dinner the night before and he'd stayed at uh, my place. And I remember waving goodbye to him as he backed out of the driveway and went back to the Big Island and later that day I get a call from my sister saying dad's dead. I'm going, well, well, you know, <laughs> how, how can he be dead? You know, I just saw him and uh, and so that was, uh, it was very, very difficult for me to come to grips with that because it was so sudden and unexpected. So that, that changed a lot of things and made me reflect on life and what was important and... Uh, and how short it can be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I think losing our son was a very tragic thing and it made me really think about uh, balance and what are, what are the really important things in life. And uh, um, it, ma it makes you reprioritize things. When you've had adversity, it's been to show you about priorities in life, the value of time and family and love. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How precious uh, our loved ones are, whether they're family or friends or, or whatever. Do you feel too busy sometimes? Because Sometimes. healthcare is, is a busy thing. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, I look at that, that picture that I have um, from 20 years ago when I was uh, uh, being interviewed by you. At that time, she must have been about six months old, Katie, our youngest, you know, reaching for the TV set trying to touch mommy. And that picture to me, it means a lot because it was a time when I was so busy and I was never had enough time with the kids and I would miss really important events because of commitments in my professional career. Usually it would be because I had to take care of a patient and that came first regardless, you know, and so thank goodness I had a supportive husband, but I always felt this being torn that I wanted to be with my children and I felt I hated being away from them and so that was a perfect example I think it was a evening interview and I wasn't home with the kids and here's so my husband puts me on TV so the little one can see me and she's trying to reach me and she can't you know where's you know trying to touch me through the TV set and uh, I mean those kinds of moments just are very poignant. Some of the choices you make are aren't bad choices ones you know I mean choices between good values, right. family, work. I don't know that I would do anything differently. I really value the, the career that I've followed. Um, my kids have turned out fine, you know. I, I don't think that uh, I've neglected them in any way and they're resilient and uh, they, they're proud of me, I think, and uh, I don't think it was a mistake. And certainly their mom hasn't had just any job. I mean, essentially you're out slaying the beasts of uh, things that drive up the cost of health care and, and, and bring down the quality of health care. Looking for justice and fairness, trying to get the best to everybody. I've heard so many people say that our, our health care system is broken and, and there really isn't um, authentic hope on the horizon. What mm -hmm. do you think? 
Oh, well, I disagree. Well, I agree it's broken, and that's why I got involved uh, 20 years ago to fix it. But I, I don't, I think there is hope on the horizon, and the things I see, it hasn't happened everywhere in the country yet. There's big gaps across the country, and, and, and within Hawaii, too, as far as the, the progress towards creating a system approach to the health care for patients. Uh, but I am very, very impressed and pleased with the progress that we've made, um, I'm at least in my organization. Uh, as I said earlier, I, some of the things we're doing now, I never even dreamed we'd be at this point, and it isn't perfect yet, but it's moving in the right direction. And do you think your job will ever be done? No, no. And never. that's okay with you? Yes. Oh, you don't want your job to be done, right? <laughs> There's always, you know, I think, uh, I think one thing I've decided about life is, uh, number one, we're not expected to know why and, and when and where and how long. Um, and that it's all meaningful and uh, it just makes it more precious. Precious indeed. And in case you're wondering, if Dr. Ginny Pressler were a man, I would still have asked the question about work-life balance. It's not a single gender issue. Dr. Pressler is among those fighting for justice and fairness in Hawaii's healthcare system while making time for personal health and well-being. She and her husband are regular stand-up paddlers and outdoor enthusiasts. Thank you, Dr. Jenny Pressler, for sharing your story with us. And mahalo to you for watching. For PBS Hawaii and Long Story Short, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Ahoy ho! For audio and written transcripts of all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. To download free podcasts of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, go to the Apple iTunes Store or visit pbshawaii.org. So I've always had this sense of urgency and impatience, and as I've gotten older, I'm finally beginning to realize, you know what, slow down, you know? Even at stoplights, it's like, don't get frustrated because that person didn't pull out yet. It's just like, just, you know, stop you can't at the clouds. It, so and, you know, let it, let it just be. Let, yeah. So I'm, I'm becoming a little bit more patient as I get older, and I think children teach you patience.